Welcome to On the Same Page, a second generation series of experiences with nationally recognized and award-winning authors, artists, and creators, brought to you by KET Education and the KET Young Writers Contest. We're glad you've joined us to learn from and collaborate with industry professionals from across the nation, as well as from right here in the Commonwealth. Grab pencils, some paper, and your creativity, and let's get on the same page with today's guest creator. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me in. I love seeing your faces in your classrooms. It's really my, my very favorite part of my job is connecting with readers and writers. So this is a happy day for me, and I'm so, I'm so pleased I could be here. What, what I would love to do is um, share with you one small part of my writing process, uh, something that I do at the very beginning when I'm just starting a new story, when I'm thinking about what I might write next and I'm just trying to get some new ideas. So if you have um, a laptop or a pencil or paper or notebook or whatever you like to write with, if you have that and you wanna follow along, that would be so fun. Um, but there's one thing that I share with writers every time I do a workshop, I want to make sure that I remind you that every writer has their own process and every writer has a bunch of strategies that work really well for them and some strategies that don't work at all. So if today what I show you sparks some ideas and you get some excitement for a story, then that's so great and I'm so happy for that. But if today you try to follow along and you feel like you got an empty page and you're feeling a little frustrated, that does not mean that you are not a writer. It means that this strategy today didn't work for you. And that is a huge part of writing is figuring out what works for you and what doesn't. So if you're feeling frustrated today, that doesn't mean that you are not a writer. You are all writers. You all can be writers. And a, a big part of that is just figuring out how you write your stories. And so I want to help you today try to figure out if this is maybe a strategy that might work. Now, if I were in your classrooms with you, like right there, literally in your classrooms, I would be doing um, this with my notebooks. I'm a notebook writer all the way. I love to write in notebooks with paper, pens, like old school style. Um, and it's, it's not usually tidy. It's usually pretty messy. Um, so you would see me doing some work like this in front of you today. But I wanted to make sure that you could see it on the screen. So I did make it into some slides so that it was easier to follow along. Um, but any way that you choose to sort of write and jot in your notebook works really well today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that you can see that. And there we go, are we good? Can you see that? Great, okay. Um, so these are my books and I wanna share with you how each one of these stories comes from a very small moment, like it starts with a very small moment that I experienced in my own childhood when I was about the age of my main characters. So a big part of my process is going back and thinking back to when I was little, when I was 9, 10, 11, 12, the age of my main characters, and thinking about some big emotions that I felt when I was that age. So the first thing that I might do is just make a list in my notebook of some feelings that I know I felt when I was little and I, and I almost can feel them still in my body. So I know what it feels like to feel angry. So I write that down, that's a feeling I know. And if you wanna write down um, the ones that I'm writing down, you certainly can, or you can add new ones or you could just watch if you want. I know what it feels like to feel proud. I definitely have some moments that I remember feeling really proud when I was little. I definitely felt excited and nervous at times and sad. I definitely had moments where I felt scared. And I also felt some moments where I felt guilty or regret, like I wish I could take something back or say something different. And so I start with just writing down some of these emotions, some of these feelings, because I want to make sure that when I write a character, I'm writing a character who has um, honest feelings, like they feel real when you're reading them. So I want to make sure it's a feeling that I have felt and that I can remember. And so I look out at these, at this list that I make in my notebook. And I think I, I kind of let my eye go to one. And I, and I try to think of a moment when I felt one of these feelings in like a really big way. So my eye is going to proud right now. And so I'm going to share with you a story where I felt something really like when I felt really proud when I was little. 
And I'm not going to write the whole thing. When I'm just starting a story, I am just starting some ideas. I jot little things. I write a little. I think a lot and I feel a lot, but I write a little. So I'll tell you the whole story, but I'm just jotting when I found a stray dog in the woods behind my house. So this was a moment when I was 10 and I was outside in my backyard playing when I saw a dog in the woods. And I could see that her tail was tucked between her legs, her ears were back and she was skinny and she didn't have a collar. So I knew she was lost. And I, I didn't wanna like go into the woods and scare her away, but I, I didn't know how to get her to come because she wouldn't come when I called. And I just kept trying and trying and like calling her. And I went inside and I actually got some of my own dog's treats and I was trying to lure her out of the woods. And, and I stayed there the whole afternoon, just calling her and I got really low and I put my hand out. And then like one step at a time, I remember the dog, she finally walked to me and it was really slow and she ate the treat right out of my hand. And and then she was like kind of stuck to my side, like she wouldn't leave. She she stayed right with me and I walked her to um, to the front door where my mom was. And my mom gave me a look that was like, wow, good job. But also a look that said, we don't have room for this dog and we're not keeping it. So don't think that we are. And I remember feeling really proud that like I was patient enough that this dog trusted me, that I got her out of the woods but then I also felt a little heartbroken. And sometimes when I remember these moments from my childhood, I, I noticed that there was more than one feeling involved. So I was proud that I helped this dog, but I was also really heartbroken. And I was proud when we brought it to the, to the vet and the vet said that this dog was malnourished and needed water and food. And that, you know, I felt really proud that I'd probably saved this dog's life. And I never forgot what that felt like. I never forgot that feeling of, of being so proud, but also really feeling connected to the dog and really wishing I could keep it. So that's one moment. And I don't feel like I need to write it all out in my notebook when I'm just starting to think about the emotions. I just kind of jot a little, it's not even a full sentence, a little half sentence just to remind me. And I'll give you one more example. And you can be writing along as I'm talking, or I can give you a minute afterwards if you want to take a minute to jot too. This is a moment when I felt really guilty, like I wished I had done something differently. Um, when I was nine, I took the bus to school. And there was a girl on my bus whose name was Casey, and she was really shy and she was really nice. Um, but when I was young, there was this thing on the radio where there were like the top 40 songs. The grownups will probably maybe re remember this too. The top 40 songs were always playing on the radio of the week, the 40 songs of the week. And the, the DJ's name on the radio was Casey Kasem. And so they would say, and there was a little jingle that would go along with it. It would say, I'm Casey Kasem with the weekly top 40. And it was on like all the time. And everyone started to make fun of Casey, the girl on our bus, because she had the same name as Casey Kasem on the radio. And so whenever she walked by, people would be like, oh, it's the weekly top 40 with Casey Kasem. And they would just kind of make fun of her. And it was never anything really mean, mean. Like they weren't saying like, like you're stupid or you're dirty or we hate you. They weren't, they weren't like really, really bullying her, but they were really frustrating her and they wouldn't stop. And they did it all the time. And then I remember one day on the bus, Casey stood up, like she literally stood up in the bus and she faced the kids that were singing the jingle and making fun of her name. And she, and she said, I want you to stop. It's really annoying. Stop making fun of my name. Don't do it anymore. And I remember thinking, I was sitting in, this, in, the, um, in the seat across from her, and I remember thinking, gosh, she just did everything right. Like she got brave, she spoke up, she looked those kids right in the eyes and she said, stop. And then the kids didn't stop. They were like, weekly top 40, and they just kept laughing. And then I knew in my heart what I was supposed to do. I knew that I was supposed to stand up and like stand next to her and say, you guys seriously stop right? And add my voice and be brave. And I just, I didn't because I, I was actually a little scared that those kids would start laughing at me or thinking, think something about my name and like come up with a really annoying thing. And, and so I didn't, I just stayed quiet and the bus started moving again. And Casey sat back down and the moment was over and I couldn't go back. And, and I just, the whole ride to school, I felt really guilty. And like, I, I felt like, I wish I could rewind it and go back. I felt regret and I'm, I'm 38 now. And I remember that moment from when I was nine. And I remember that feeling really well. And so when I'm thinking about back to these moments, I try to think of the big feelings. And then I just jot the little, the little moment that I remember 
that go with these feelings. So I'm gonna give you just like a 30 second break where I'm not talking in case you wanna at least write down some emotions, some things that you can remember for later on. Um, if you're not doing it right now, you might return to your notebook. Um, so you might add an, another emotion, you might add another feeling or another memory. Um, and I'll just give you kind of like 30 seconds where I'm, where I'm not talking if you wanna take a minute. You can also take this time to share with someone else if you're remembering something, a, a, something that you're remembering, you want to share it with someone else. <laughs> okay. And so then the next thing that I do is I try to find a way that I can write the story out, but like really short, because the purpose of this is for me to like relive it and remember the feelings, not to like write the whole thing out in like a big, long story, but just to kind of remember the feelings. So there, there are three ways that I sometimes think about doing this, and you might think about the best one for you. So first I pick the moment that I'm ready to write about, and I, I'm going to pick the one about the stray dog, right? You could try to write the story in six words. You could try drawing a picture of the story, or you could try to write the story as a text message or like a note that you might pass in class. So these are all really short ways to get us sort of um, back into that emotional space of feeling the feelings. So if I were to try to tell my story in just six words, I might write, found a dog, mom said no, or wanted to keep her heart broke, or got low, hand out, she came. Okay, so these, these little six word stories are bringing me back into that memory, bringing me back into that, that time when I felt so proud and so heartbroken to not be able to keep her and so connected to the dog. The, just these little six words are kind of bringing me back into that, that memory. And that's the purpose of it. Now, some people are really visual. I'm, I'm, I don't usually work with pictures. I usually hear things first. Like I, I like to hear the way that voices sound and characters sound, but a lot of people can really see scenes. Like when they're reading, they can see things in their brain and they can really see things out. So if you are that kind of person, then maybe drawing a picture of the story um, might help. I am, my son is an artist. He actually had to help me draw that picture. He's really visual, whereas I'm more like audio. And then if I were to write this story as a text message or like a note that I might pass in class, I might say, found the best, yo found the best dog yesterday. She trusted me. Mom won't let me keep her, but I have to. Right? So these, these little tiny things that I might write in my notebook, right? These little tiny jots are things that bring me back into that memory, that, that remind me how proud I felt, that remind me how connected I felt to that dog and how, how much of a bummer it was to have to let her go. Um, and so I use that emotion and I use these little seed ideas to think about how I could write a story from this. So the last thing that I would do as this, for this part of the strategy is I would finish this sentence. I could write a story about Now, because I have felt this, this feeling and I've had this experience, I could write a story about, and I take my experience and I take the feelings that I had and I kind of think about where I could take the story now. I could write a story about a kid who finds a stray dog and she really wants to keep it, but she helps find the dog's owner who turns out to be a kid who really missed the dog. Like I could tell that story because I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to find a stray dog and I know what it feels like to want to keep it. I could write a story about a kid who wants a dog, but her mom says no. And she has to prove that she is responsible enough for a pet. Right. I know that feeling. I know I knew the feeling of wanting to convince my mom. I could write a story about a kid who finds a stray dog and her mom says she can't keep it, but she visits the Humane Society every day and proves to her mom that she is loyal and they belong together. Okay, so here just like I'm just kind of getting some ideas by finishing that sentence. I could write a story about. 
because I have felt this emotion, because I've had this little experience, I could write all these different stories just from this tiny moment. And in fact, my book, Brave Like That, I don't know if any of you have read it, but it is a story about a boy named Cyrus, and he finds a stray dog, and his dad says no, and it's about his connection to this dog. That's just one part of the story, but that part of the story came from that moment when I was 10 years old in my backyard and I was feeling so proud that this dog was coming to me. And it became this, I call it a little seed because I grew the whole story from that tiny little seed moment. I grew a whole novel called Brave Like That. Now, Cyrus is a lot different than I am. He he plays football and he's got a firefighter for a dad and he's adopted and he lives in Minnesota. And so he's, he's a lot different than I am, but there's a part of his heart that came directly from my heart. His experience came directly from my experience. And so that's that's how I start thinking about some ideas and how I grow them from these little tiny seed emotions that I felt when I was the age of my characters. And so I'm going to stop the share now. And know that I, if I were with you in your classrooms, I wouldn't normally go that fast. I'm not, I'm not a very fast writer. Um, I do things pretty slowly and I do a lot of thinking and a lot of feeling and a little bit of writing usually when I do write. Um, but I hope at least you have some of the bones of that, that strategy. So that if you want to go back and try it out, you can. Um, I think we have, so we have time for questions now. Okay. I'll start. Uh, we got a couple questions from some students from, uh, Murray middle school that are with us today, Adeline, Lillian, and Layla. Uh, first question is, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? <laughs> chocolate chip cookie dough. That's an easy one. <laughs> Definitely That's an important chip. question. Actually. Chocolate chip cookie dough. Yeah. <laughs> the second question I had is why did you enjoy being a English teacher? Oh, I loved teaching English so much. Um, I wanted to be a teacher. Like when I was really little, that was my dream job. Um, and I always wanted to be a teacher because I knew I would be surrounded by books. But when I when I became a teacher of middle school, that was like that was really a perfect spot for me. I love teaching middle school because um, that age, like their hearts, your hearts are so wide open at that age and your sense of justice, like what's right and wrong is really high. Like you all know what is right and wrong and you are not afraid to talk about that. And I love that. It makes it really fun to read books with like a group of middle schoolers because you guys always judge characters. You think about what they should have done, what should happen next. And you're honest. And I just, I love that about middle school. So um, that that's when I, when I was a teacher of middle school, that's when I knew that I wanted to write middle grade books. Um, I always knew I wanted to be an author, but I knew I wanted to write for middle grade when I was a middle grade teacher. We've got lots of great questions coming in the chat too. Um, from Jill McGlone's class, like how long have you been writing? What made you start writing? And then Christy Unker asks, after you write your books, how do you get them published? Great. Um, I've I've been writing for a really long time. I've been writing since I was a kid. Um, And and I, I wanted to become a writer because I loved books so much. And when I figured out that like real people wrote books, that was sort of fascinating to me. And I was like, I could actually do that. So I, um, I wanted to become an author and give it a, give it a try. When I was younger, I struggled with writing. Um, and that was because I didn't, I didn't know my writing process. And I learned one writing process in school and it, it didn't work for me. And so I thought that, and it did work for some of my friends. And so I thought that I just wasn't, um, that I just wasn't going to be the writer that I wanted to be. And that I would always be a reader and I would always try to be a teacher. But, um, but I, I experienced a lot of uh, frustration with writing when I was younger. Um, and, and then when I became a teacher, I realized, you know, I, I would have like classes of 35 kids at a time and all of those kids were so different and they all wanted, and they were very honest. So they all told me when things worked and didn't work. And it was so interesting to me to figure out how, how to teach 35 different writers. And then, and then I thought, well, wait a minute. I'm a writer too, and I just have to find my way. And so I work my way back into writing. And so I really owe it to the students in my classroom for opening my mind to become a writer again. Um, and so I, I started publishing books when I, for the past like six years, I've been publishing books. So um, I started when I was, I started writing again when I was a teacher and um, and published my first book in 2018. Yeah. And and um, to get it published, that that was the last question there. I'm sorry, what was the last one? 
that was it. Like, how do you get them published when you're done? Yeah. So when you have a, when you have a story that you, that you think is like the best that you can make it and you're ready for some help, um, you, the way that I did it was I wrote to some, these people called agents. And so some like famous sports people have them and music people have them. And sometimes writers will have them too. Um, and an agent is like, um, it's like a business friend, like this person that's going to read your book and tell you what they think. And if they like it, then they are going to take that book and they're going to try to sell it to the publishing house that prints the books and makes them. Um, and so I, I looked at some of my very favorite middle grade books that I thought were similar to the story that I was writing. And I found out who those authors agents were. And I wrote to those agents. Um, and my first book, I wrote to 10 agents and I got back 10 responses and they all said no. <laughs> and that's how it is for writers. There's a lot of, there's a lot of no, and there's a lot of um, trying again. And uh, one thing that a few of the agents said that I remembered was, they said, this, we love your writing, but this book is not working for us. And so if you ever write something different, please feel free to send that. And I was, I mean, I was crushed because I had spent three years writing this book and I couldn't imagine starting a new one. Um, and so I was, I was crushed, but I was walking to school one day in New York City and a new voice started to come into my brain and I was just kind of playing with the character and I was thinking back to some moments in my childhood and I was doing some of these little jots that I was showing you in my notebook and, and all of a sudden I just started writing again and, um, and a couple of years later I had a different book and I wrote back to the same agents and I said, do you remember me? You liked my writing and I have a new book <laughs> and, um, and that's when I got my agent was um, when I got the second, the second manuscript that I wrote. But it did, it took some not giving up and some patience and time. And I was doing what I loved anyway. So it was, it felt fun and exciting. What book was that, Lindsay, if you don't mind my asking? Yeah, that was, that was Just Like Jackie was just the first. Like Jackie, cool. Yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> um, somebody asked, let's see, Jill McGlone, um, what made you want to be a teacher? Um, well, my dad, so when I was little, um, I loved books. Like I brought them everywhere. I was obsessed with books. Even before I knew how to read, I would like pretend that I knew how to read and I would like line up my stuffed animals and do pretend read alouds. Um, and my dad, uh, who was a really quiet, smart guy, um, he said to me one day, if you can figure out what it is that you really love in the world, like whatever it is, and then figure out how to make that thing into your job, then you'll be happy. And for me, it was books. And so I thought of all these different jobs that had to do with books and teacher was definitely one of them. Um, and then author was one. And so um, that was that was the advice that I always carried with me. I was like, try to figure out how to make books at the center of my job. And like, then I'll just be, I'll be happy. And then I think we have time for uh, probably one or two more questions. A couple um, more questions. Yeah, we have, does anyone else in your family write books? And do you have writer for <laughs> um, no one else in my family does write books. Well, I, you know what, I have a five and a six year old and they write books all the time. They staple together little pieces of paper and they write books. Um, but I don't have any other writer uh, family members. Um, and what was the second part of that question? I'm sorry. Do you have writer friends? I do have some writer friends. Um, I have some that are closer than others. I, um, I'm I would love to drop some like famous names for you and be like, I know this person and this person. <laughs> I know, I know a lot of people through, there are a lot of communities online of writers. So like I'm connected with people that I think are amazing and, and we're not friends in real life, but we're friends online. And sometimes we'll see each other at conferences, um, which is really fun. It always feels like you're in a community, even when you're not living in the same place. Um, so we get to see each other at conferences and we get to chat through Twitter or whatever it is and email and, um, and that feels great. Yeah. So we have a couple more fun questions to end our morning. Uh, also, uh, again, from uh, Murray Middle School is uh, what is your dog's name and breed? <laughs> Penny. Oh, I wanted to know that, too. <laughs> yeah, Penny. Um, let me see. She's she's usually sleeping right behind me. Let me see if I can grab her. Yeah, there she is. Her name is Penny and she's mixed breed. She's a rescue pup. And there she is. Oh, my goodness. She How likes to be, she likes to be curled up right in the books, just like me. Um, but yeah, she's, um, she's like a lab hound mix sort of dog. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then do you like chess or do you play chess? I don't know how to play chess. And I think I'm going to learn with my kids because my kids right now are like really into checkers and board games are becoming really fun. 
So I'm going to learn. There are a few things that I didn't learn when I was little that I want to learn now. One of them is chess and one of them is the piano. So I think I'm going to learn with my kids as they're learning those two things. Oh, what, and what great questions, too. Yeah. Way. I have to say, I love the Absolutely. variety of questions. <laughs> had such a good time. I'll see you all soon, I hope.